So my project was on the effects of shelterwood and passionate harvests on the post white nose syndrome bat community in the Cumberland Plateau in eastern Kentucky. First thing I'm going to talk about is a, a little bit about white nose syndrome. It arrived in the United States in 2006, as likely brought to the U.S. by cavers. And if you see the little red dot in the picture off the right, that's where it started. But in 10 years, it spread across the eastern United States. And it likely uh, came over here from Europe from cavers, which had dirt on their shoes or something. The fungus started out in that first cave, but it spread from that cave to other caves by a combination of bats and people. Bats carried on their fur and like their wings, and they travel from cave to cave when they do fall swarming and spring staging. And people carry it on their equipment in like shoes and clothing and like dirt. Now, this fungus isn't going to go away anytime in the near future because it lives without a host. It can live within the soil or like the wall of the cave and decompose organic material. But when bats are hibernating, it causes tissue damage and it opportunistically infects them. The tissue damage causes arousal and causes them to uh, prompt an immune, well, they arouse to prompt an immune response to try to fight it off. They do other behaviors like grooming and drinking water and trying to feed just to deal with the energetic cost of the fungus. And if they can't manage to do so, it results in death. And it's been pretty severe for several species. One of the long eared bats, tricolored bats, little brown and Indiana bats in particular. To just give you an example of how devastating this fungus is, if you look at the, the uh, table on the right hand side, you see mice, which is more than long eared bat, and then a uh, <clears throat> study in Mammoth Cave. It went from catching 425 little long eared bats in a two year period, like survey period, to two in the survey. And the surveys had about equal effort. For tricolor bats, which are Pisu and are highlighted yellow, it went from 100 to 11. For little browns, which are Milu, it went from 65 to 7. So what you're seeing is about a 98% decline in northern long eared bats, about a 90% decline in tricolored and little brown bats in a 10 year period, about a 10 year period. 12, I think, technically. But <clears throat> now, in perspective, Indiana bats were already endangered before white nose came to the United States. They were endangered due to historic cave disturbances. They hibernated in a few locations with very large numbers. And when things like tourism entered places like Mammoth Cave, it caused a pretty severe impact for them. There are also other things that happened, like putting in bat gates that flooded and killed individuals, and several other factors. So white nose is just exasperating and already present problem. Now, Indiana bats live in forests in summer, and they roost under cone bark of large trees with solar exposure. And they don't live randomly throughout a forest. Females live in concentrated areas, like in large things called maternity colonies. And maternity colonies consisted of lots of females and pups. Normally, so 100, 150 tends to be an average size colony. And each one of these females only has one puppy a year. So when the impact of bats, takes a long time to recover from. It can take decades to really recover from any real decline. The northern long eared bat is now federally threatened. I think it happened in 2015, might have been 2016, but white nose caused such a severe impact the warranted listing of the species. Similar to Indiana bats, they hibernate in caves in winter, but in summer they live within forested areas. These also form maternity colonies of females and pups, which live in tree cavities under pillow bark. They don't form as large of colonies as Indiana bats, they're closer to like 50, 30 to 50 is a more typical colony. But thanks to white nose syndrome, they're now extremely rare throughout much of their reigns. It's like seeing the American robin go on the endangered species list. And the populations that are alive, we're finding out they don't hibernate typically, or they hibernate in areas where the fungus can't grow. We found that they're hibernating in basements along the coast. They're also just not hibernating, period, in places like South Carolina. And they're remaining active throughout winter. The tricolor and little brown bat have not been listed yet, but they're petitioned to be listed. The only reason they probably haven't been is their large ranges. And as white nose is starting to expand into the known range, it's more likely to become listed. And it's very probable it happen in the near future. Little brown bats, like Indiana and Northern Longyear bats, only have one pup per year. And historically, they were common within buildings. They typically form turning colonies and attics of sometimes several hundred individuals, although they do also roost under bark in cavities within forests. And post white nose, these bats are extremely rare and difficult to find. Tricolored bats have two pups a year, and they're in frequent post white nose syndrome. 
they have low populations throughout a lot of the range still. And they, unlike the other bats, they roost in leaves, like dead leaf clusters at the top of the trees. So as I've talked to you about in the last few slides, many bats live for it, live for it and raise young in forest in summer. <laughs> and then uh, logging practices have a potential to impact several of these threatened and endangered bat species by removing breeding habitat and potentially disturbing females and pups in their maternity colonies within like dead snags or trees. So the point of my study was to investigate what the impacts, to investigate the impacts of logging on bats in Appalachian post white syndrome. And we evaluated this in a few different methods. We collected acoustic data with acoustic units to gauge activity levels of bats and fur species presence. We put out light traps to evaluate the insect prey at base. We missed it to confirm presence and assess absence of species. And we collect individuals to tag, to try to locate roosts, preserve them once the cuts occurred. And what you see here off the red sign, right hand side, is a picture of me uh, finding a roost tree, which I was very excited about because we didn't expect to find it in our study. And once we find these roost trees, the goal is to form emergence counts to gauge populations. <clears throat> I want to take a moment to talk a little bit about acoustic cell. Singing from birds and echolocation of bats are very different. Birds communicate species level information with songs, they do it to defend territories and attract mates. The bats echolocate and navigate on the landscape. And that makes the calls very variable, and many species can have overlapping calls. So identifying bats by echolocation is an exact science. And bats have several different types of calls to further confound this. They use search phase calls to navigate, feeding buzzes to locate prey. They can actually jam each other's calls, prevent them from like catching prey. They also have social calls to communicate various forms of information. And typically we divide bats into three different groups, high, medium, and low. Um, the high group is the myotis. They typically feed in cluttered environments. And the medium group is a red tricolored eating bats. And they typically feed more like edge habitat. They're kind of an in-between to the low and high frequency feeders. And the low frequency feeders typically fly through open spaces to feed. And this is really the big brown silver hair quarry quarry bat. So my hypothesis for the study was that low and medium frequency colors, the big brown quarry silver haired red tricolored and evening bats should increase activity in forest harvests. And the high frequency colors, my own species, should decrease activity in forest harvest because of clutters being removed. Now, the caveat to this the populations can be near undetectable post white nose syndrome. It can make this very hard to assess. And all these trends could be influenced by prey availability. And this was supposed to be a long term project that took between five to two years to complete. And I was, like Dr. Lackey said in my introduction, I was around for four years 2015, 2018. 2018, I just collected data at Robinson Forest as a consultant, because it was the first year post-harvest. And from 2015 to 2017, I collected data from all three sites. If you've never been to Robinson Forest, it's in between Jackson and Hazard, Kentucky, a little bit past Buckhorn. The beach site is outside of Jackson, Kentucky, is owned by a private organization. And Kentucky Ridge State Forest is down in Pineville. I travel between all three sites to collect acoustic data. And each site had three 40 hectare adjacent blocks. One was a shelter wood, which put the picture you see on the bottom left side of the screen, and the patch cuts on the bottom right, and on a harvested section. So in the shelter wood, we removed about 50% of the basal area, and in the patch cuts, there were 23 one hectare patch cuts. <clears throat> so for our acoustic survey, we set out acoustic units. The circle you see at the bottom is the acoustic unit housed within a pelican case, which is chained to a tree to prevent black bears from dragging off. Several of my acoustic cases have giant teeth marks in them from black bears grabbing a hold of them and trying to eat them. And if you look along the side of the tree, you see a cord running up to the microphone, which is in PVC pipe, to again partially prevent the bears from eating, but also to direct the acoustic like collection. And we move these detectors between transect points at all three of the sites I just mentioned. And the transects consisted of a ridgetop, mid slope, and riparian location. And the transect points were moved slightly after the forest harvest to ensure they were opening cuts. And when I say a bat call, I want to show you guys a picture of what that is. So if you look off to the right hand side where the pictures are, both of these are an example of a bat call. And this, these can be identified as species a portion of the time. And each Calls comprise of passes. Each one of these little tick marks 
is a pass or a pulse, whatever you care to call it. And the pulse is like our gauges of activity. And there's no set number of pulses in each call, it could be from one to 500. So a call and a pulse are just two different metrics to evaluate activity. From our pre-harvest data, we found that the sites did not have equal activity. Myotis activity was much higher at Robin Forest, which you can see in the graph off to the uh, right-hand side of the screen. See that it's well above the other two like sites. And silver hair bat activity was much higher at each site than the other two sites. I don't have that picture in this slide. And this is because of landscape factors we didn't quantify in our study. <clears throat> but because of this, the analysis of each site was performed separately. And for our statistical analysis of the post-harvest data, we did a quasi poisson regression because the data was overdispersed. And as a disclaimer, we uh, the patch cut riparian areas were not sampled. The idea was to sample more of forest harvest because no harvest occurred within the uh, riparian areas. This made some of the statistical analysis less powerful. And we performed individual tests for differences in species activity between years, which was a proxy for pre and post-harvest, and the different slope positions within treatment. So. <clears throat> And the overdispersion corrections made it difficult to observe some differences. And that's what I used in my thesis. But for our publication, we did a negative binomial regression. We created a best fit model for each species and total number of pulses. But this analysis was performed by Wendy, so I'm not going to talk about it much in my discussion. Now, if you look off to the right, activity increased post harvest. And you look to the graph on the right, you can see the activity increase. The red and the uh, Green line or uh, bar, as you see off to the side, show a clear increase from the blue bar. And activity greatly increased post harvest. And both the shelterwood and patch cuts, which is what you see on the bottom right graph, had higher activity than unharvested sections. And we saw that tricolor bad, tricolored evening, big brown, red, and silver red bass increased in activity. And little brown and quarry bass increased activity during a single year. But most of the activity increase really occurred from red, big brown, and silver hair bats, <clears throat> which is what you can see in the uh, graphs. And I'll give you a second to look at them. So I'll probably pause for like 10, 20 seconds to give you a chance to actually look at the graphs. And the same trend occurred at Kentucky Ridge. We saw a large activity increase, which you can notice in the red bar. And again, the shelterwood harvest and patch cuts had higher activity than unharvested section. And we saw an increase in activity from tricolor to evening, big brown, red, or and silver hair bats. But most of the activity increase occurred due to red, big brown, and silver hair bats. And I'm again going to give you like 10, 20 seconds to look at the graphs. Now, Robinson Forest's results look a little different, and I'll explain some of that. The um, impact control has the highest level of activity on the ridge top, and that's because it was harvested accidentally. So our control is got a little messed up there. And the shelterwood stream, the high activity you see there, is the streams of larger ore than the other streams in the impacted control section and in the uh, patch cut. But the same trend occurred. Activity increased after the harvest. Although it was far less than other sites, the highest activity we had here was a thousand pulses per detector night. Whereas if we flip back to Kentucky Ridge, you can see that 8,000 was more typical. And this is likely due to landscape features, which led to the uh, number of big browns present in the area. Uh, a large roost is actually located several miles away, and they have closer and better foraging options. And that probably accounts for the differences in activity. Um, Again, same trend that big browns, red, and silver hair bats strongly contributed to the increase. Myotis activity mainly occurred within the riparian areas. You can see the activity of all the species on the graph on the left. The graph on the right shows myotis activity, and most of the uh, calls were recorded within the riparian area. And this is because these are forested corridors where they feed primarily. 
Again, I'll give you 10 or 20 seconds to look at the graph. I should probably take a moment to explain this coding kind of space that one. Um, F boost stands for big brown, Labo is red bad, Lacey is hoary, Leno is silver haired, uh, Milo is little brown, My is normal long ear bad, My so is Indiana bad, My who's evening bad, and uh, Isu is tricolor bad. I'm sorry for not explaining that sooner. And what you really see is that harvest dramatically increased bad activity. And patch cut and shovel and harvest both have more bad activity than unharvested sections. But mountainous activity in the harvest areas is low. And tricolor bats increase activity in forest harvests. And the majority of the increase in activity is likely from big brown and red bats, which are pictured off to the right. For insect sampling, we deploy light traps, and this collects phototaxic species, mainly moths and beetles, which are common prey sources for bats. And insects hit the lid of the trap with side plates and fall into the bucket. And there's a pesticide inside that kills the insects, and these are powered by large external batteries. So in the forest harvest, we collect data from midsill points to minimize setup time. We just pick one location. Although we had several transects throughout each site. And what we found is that moth abundance decreased in sheltered harps and patch cuts, despite the light, light traps being more effective in open spaces. We also misnetted to guarantee identification of bats. And we set up nets over ponds, ATV paths, streams, and corridors. In beach, we mainly misnetted post harvest. And the uh, patch cuts was the easiest place for us to misnet. And we captured mainly red and big brown bats, but we also captured tricolor bats, which is really exciting for those white nose. It's very difficult to like find them, especially in these real numbers. So catching four tricolor bats doesn't seem like a big deal compared to the 22 and 17, but post white nose, it's fantastic numbers. And we caught all age classes. We caught an adult male, a lactating female, and two juveniles. And it's also exciting to see that this bat, which is being impacted by white nose syndrome, is foraging or at least present within these cuts. And I want to take a moment and show you some uh, missed any data prior to like white nose that occurred at Robinson Forest. A uh, study about, done by Dr. Lackey and Dr. Krupa caught mainly northern long-eared bats. They made up the largest percentage of catch, followed by Labo or red bats, and then followed by big brown. And I'm skipping over Leno, which are silver-haired bats, because they're mainly migratory in the region. And they pass through in migratory waves, so catching a few, a lot, and a few nights is really common, and then you just won't see them the rest of the summer. Also, notice that they caught seven tricolor bats. They used to be a fairly common species. Now, for my missing data, my results look remarkably similar. I caught 36 more than longer bats, followed by 26 red and 16 big brown. I actually caught an Indiana bat on my study. Um, most of these northern long ear bats were caught in 2.6 millimeter single high nets, which are over closed canopy rows and ridge tops. And post harvest, my results were a little different though. I captured two northern long ear bats almost from a side away from the harvest, and the other one was captured in a ridge top road adjacent to the harvest, but it was a closed canopy road and not the harvest itself. But I also caught two tricolor bats, which I hadn't seen up until that point in my study, despite extending missing a good portion of the forest. I caught a lactating female juvenile next to the cut in the riparian zone, which is really exciting. And the other difference between this and uh, the beach crop is we caught a lot more red bats here, a lot fewer big brown. These uh, northern longer bats and the Indiana bat had a small transmitter attached to their back, which you can see here in the picture to the right. And picture of the left at the bottom, you see the transfer trailing behind the bat as it flies off. And these transfers last between eight to 14 days on paper, but typically manage to chew them off about five or six. And in total, we tagged 16 male northern longer bats, four males, two juveniles, and 10 females. We tagged the one female Indiana bat. And we collected data on eight of these females, two males, and the rest for the wall. Sadly, in eastern Kentucky, you only get signal from about one ridge top away. It becomes very difficult to locate bats. And for the female Indiana bat, that's what we ran into. I actually called Fish and Wildlife for some help. It's such an exciting find in the region. 
And they hired Copperhead Consulting, which flew a 12 mile radius to my capture location looking for the bat and just no one ever got a signal. They still have no clue where she went. So these bats went to trees where they roost. We found that they roost in a variety of species and the trees were both alive and dead. They were found in snags, cavities, and knot holes. And they basically roost in trees at the same frequency where they're present in like random plots. So predominantly they roost in red maples, which are the been robins forest, one of the most common tree species on the forest. And they actually have cavities present in all age classes. So very small trees have like knot holes or small cavities where that can insert itself. And they often die forming snags with killing bark as adults. So they make for good habitat. And what we really saw is this five stage roosting pattern. Um, first stage is early pregnancy where they shove themselves in the, when I talked about the small cavities, and it's normally a single individual. And these trees have limited solar exposure. If you look at the picture on the top left, you can see the two arrows. The first arrow off to the left is the bat's face that you can see in the small, like 2.5 centimeter diameter like tree. And the picture you see, or the arrow you see on the right is the antenna sticking out. <laughs> My technician actually touched the uh, transmitters that we found that bad. <laughs> the second stage is uh, pregnancy and early lactation. They switch from those small trees to the tree you see in that picture down there. And you can see the peeling bark and that's more typical snag where you'd expect to find a bat. And these trees are often sub canopy and they have peeling bark or cavities. And this is where we got our largest group sizes of bats. And these counts were actually similar to the lower end of counts for pre white nose studies, which is exciting. And these trees have more solar exposure and bats engage in fission fusion behavior. What I mean by that is bats switch roosts. They don't stay in the same tree every day. Every two to three days, they'll switch to different roost. And they have and groups split apart and come together. So one day you'll have 24, the next you'll have seven. And those other like 17 individuals flew off to another tree. Um, stage three, which is lactation, is really the same as stage two, but with smaller groups. Our max count between like seven or nine, they just conform to larger colonies they had previously. Stage four, which is late lactation, where the pups become volant. They actually roost in areas of low canopy cover, typically in snags, and roost switching was minimal. They stayed in roost for like a week sometimes. And the roost counts were often two or three with a very poor fire present. And what I mean is this. Poor bat would try to fly out of the tree and it kind of glided its way to the ground a few times. And then another bat flew out and frantically flew in circles for a minute, looking for where the other one landed. It's probably a mom and a pup, and the pup was probably learning how to fly. It's a really funny experience to have. Yeah, the fifth stage is post lactating in males, what they typically do. And this stage, they frequently will switch and get small ice counts of one to three individuals. They seem to be very non selective with roosts, and they're found in, generally in cavities, pulling bark and not holes. And I think this like pattern happens for energy conservation reasons. Um, early in the season, they're trying to conserve energy to restore loss of fat from hibernation. And females really only cluster when the young need the added heat to facilitate faster growth. And personally, I think this suggests that organs just torpor to conserve energy more frequently than similar species would seek out roots with higher solar exposure. Indiana bats would be in colonies of several hundred, and then northerns are perfectly happy in colonies of like 30 to 40. So the roost choice is based upon torpor use, I think, but this pattern needs more samples for statistical analysis. I often like to refer to uh, northern longer bats as the introverts of in that world. They really just want to be alone if possible. All the something that's really exciting and good to know for forest managers is that all these roosts are located within 100 meters of the Ridgecock Road. All they don't have the uh, road on the uh, map you see below. It basically runs between all the roosts. And bats were actively found foraging on ridgetop roads, primarily where I caught them like 98% of the time. And the DBHs of some of the roosts were as small as 2.5 centimeters. Basically, any tree near a road was a fair game. Any cavity, knot hole, or filling bark was occupied. So, kind of in summary, for my discussion is a low and mid frequency colors, the big brown, hoary, silver haired, red tricolored evening bats, increased in activity in the harvest areas. And the high frequency colors kind of had two different responses. Some populations were so low, like at the beach in Kentucky Ridge, like property post whiteness syndrome, the trends were hard to evaluate. So just weren't enough bats present. 
But at Robinson Forest, which had a population which we could evaluate, myotis species tended to decrease in activity. And I have some theories to why the myotis is prevalent. First of all, competitions increased. If you look at the graph on the right, you can see the blue bar is pre-harvest and the green and red are post-harvest, and you just see the massive difference. It's a lot of added competition for resources. If you remember what I talked about earlier, lepidopterans or moths are less common within these forest harvests, probably from predation pressure from bats. And on top of this, the structural niche of like clutter where the myotis typically occur and feed is limited within harvests. However, the tricolor bats did respond positively to forest harvests. And considering how rare they are post white nose, and the fact that you're probably going to be listed as exciting news, it seems the harvest provide foraging habitat, potential for females to be roosting within the area. And big brown and red bats respond very positively to forest harvests. And although they're common species now, the northern long bat used to be the most common species of forests, now it's federally endangered. So knowing what techniques we have available to like improve habitat for these species is also important. And I want to take one moment to give a little perspective on uh, this. If you remember the story of the Robinson Forest, it was clear cut 100 years ago. And the, for the, the forest in Dallas had northern was left. And Robinson Forest still is an experimental forest with active harvests like for experiments and management. And the population is still persisting despite that occurring. These cuts don't have a permanent impact on landscape for bats. As the forests regrow, the bats come back and use the habitat. And the closed canopy skid road, skid and haul road become foraging sites. And for forest harvest, what I've seen in some of my consulting work is you can mitigate the roost loss by putting in bat boxes. And it's a very effective technique and they very rarely take to it on ridge jobs. And although Northerners need intact forests for foraging, as long as those are present adjacent to the cup, they're still willing to even roost for root forest harvest. So I'd like to thank the staff at Robinson Forest, Arkars, the Kentucky Division of uh, Forestry, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, Forest Land Group, and the College of Agriculture for logistic and financial support. I'd like to thank Leslie and Des Debbie for their support and assistance when everything went wrong. I'm internally grateful for you guys. I'd like to thank my technicians and friends and doctors Lackey, Lackey, Vodka, and Stringer. So I'll now turn it over to questions. If you have any questions, I'm all ears.